Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be instructing this product management course, and I'm going to try to tonight give a little introduction to myself, sort of answer as many questions about maybe product management itself, Tinder, tech industry, sort of my experience, advice that I can possibly give. Um, sort of high level, my background is mostly in design. I went to Chapman University, studied business, entrepreneurship, graphic design down there. Really didn't have much direction in terms of tech or product management. It was a lot of sort of entrepreneurial habits and hobbies that led me down this path. Um, so typically also, I like to start off by figuring out who is here. And last time we went through and sort of talked to every single person before we got started, but that's gonna be tough. How about like show of hands, is there anybody here that's currently a product manager and is here tonight? Okay, nice, unique fraction. Anybody in the tech industry right now working on building mobile products, digital, web, anything like that? Okay, also anybody's, how about just like aspiring products, curious about it, want to learn more about the space and, and build cool stuff? Probably the vast majority. Um, cool, well anyway, thanks for coming again. Um, diving right back into the sort of who I am, my background. Uh, when I was in college, let's see, the first sort of startup I got involved in was called Solway Bicycles. Uh, they're actually still headquartered in Venice Beach, but it was a couple friends and I um, designing bicycles, getting the parts ordered from China, Taiwan, overseas, waiting three months for them to send us a sample, seeing how bad this bicycle was, and you know, rinse, repeat, trying to build a really cost-effective, stylish bicycle that we could sell in the flatland areas, like Los Angeles, Orange County, to college students and people who couldn't you know, drop a lot of money on bicycles. So that, you know, with every iteration, got better and better. And with the brand and uh, presence in Venice one day, and I'd say 2012, we actually got some traction. Now they have a store at the new USC student, student campus uh, building that just went up. Uh, I've been less involved now, but they've been able to grow their brand, sell more bikes, more models, and it's been great to see their growth. Um, I basically was also in college working on a couple different ideas when I was still a student. We were interested in designing performance under apparel for athletes, so talking like boxer briefs, and we were really frustrated by the fact that the underwear that we were using didn't allow mobility, didn't allow us to hold our phones anywhere, most athletic shorts didn't have pockets, so I worked with a couple buddies again and uh, some people in the fashion district in LA to develop a fabric that made sense for this sort of use case, to work on the cut and sew on the actual pairs, um, and actually refine this product and patent a side pocket that allowed users to slip their phone in their pocket or surface their keys when they were going out to the water and securely store that and like have full range of motion and work out more efficiently. So that was another fun side project um, that I thought was going to take off. I thought that was going to be like my big break, right? But as in product, you never write the first time. And you know, one thing led to the next. Worked with a nonprofit called the Cairo Society. Cairo Society brings together entrepreneurs from all around the world for a summit. Uh, it was on the New York Stock Exchange for a couple of years. Their summit was also in Laguna, I think, last year. Um, and New York again this year. But they basically needed a brand identity that would bring all these college students together and help them meet and solve Fortune 500 companies' big problems. These say like 50 startups, entrepreneurs, and then several other fellows of this Kairos program would get together and then sponsors like Autodesk, like Johnson Johnson and GE would come in, their sort of COO, CTOs, would come in and ask the big problems that they're trying to solve. Those students would get to work on those problems and through the end of the summit would have some ideas and some prototypes and concepts for them to try out. Sort of an innovative approach for entrepreneurs addressing big, big tech company problems. Um, through that, I actually got an offer to design a deck that is a pitch document to raise seed financing for a company called Human. Human was going to try to build several things in the bidding, beginning, but their main idea was a smart contacts app. Integrated with Facebook, LinkedIn, your email calendar, the whole thing, to try to give you like one source of truth for everyone you know. And it was all the you know intelligent hard work was done on the device securely so that we couldn't read any of the data. That was a big selling point. But also, you do this really cool thing that when you met somebody new, got their phone number or email address, and put it into Human, it would show their photo from our database, their you know, current work from LinkedIn that someone might have, and uh, say how many mutual friends you might have in common. So we were trying to create these like 
small real world connections in app, and that was definitely the coolest part of human. Um, a few years into human, we tried this new product idea of cooking out that one product feature into its own app called Knock Knock, which was a success and a series of failures in itself, but that product got the attention of Tinder when it was trying to build, let's see, what is it called, Tinder Social, their group matching system, and their CEO really liked our team, really liked our CEO, and then brought a good portion of us over to help build cool stuff at Tinder. So, without any specific goal, without saying like humans going to become Tinder, they really were after the same sort of um, sort of engineering and technical talent we had, and sort of product ideas that we're fighting for. Whether or not we have the right impl implementation, I think we can come back to it later. But that's a, a great way to to get into the the tech industry is to see a problem and start designing for it, and just trying to figure out like what really you know, makes this problem huge or what would scratch this itch for users and then just take a stab at it. Like, I'm not going to say that you're going to design the next life-saving or Uber, you know, like ride-saving project out there and it's not necessarily going to scratch the surface of you know, human history, but one thing leads to the next and in my experience just getting started and doing a lot of practice is, is how you at least get better at it and get, you know, start really solving problems which is what I feel like I get the opportunity to do now at Tinder. So about a year and a half ago, um, let's see, April, that's not quite a year and a half, it's a stretch, but uh, I was officially part of the Tinder team and I've been pretty busy since. The first project I worked on with these guys was integrating Spotify, so I sort of managed that partnership, bringing together another big tech company with another great product into Tinder. We really wanted people to be able to meet and share and discover music. I feel like that's a huge, Thing for people in terms of their own ability to express themselves in terms of their personality just on its own and also their ability to read other people you know maybe Spotify doesn't maybe like mutual interests in music is a good thing but non-mutual interest in music is a very bad thing like it's definitely a deal breaker more than a deal maker so it's interesting to see how that's used and that partnership is still continuing to grow which is really great to work with a company I've looked up to for so long um, furthermore, after that, let's see, a couple other projects. We began um, basically allowing users to sign up to Tinder with their phone number rather than Facebook. When we were at Human, one of the number one reviews that was one star on the App Store and the Google Play Store was forcing people to log in with Facebook. That is really obnoxious for people, as it turns out. Not everybody around the world uses Facebook. In fact, Russia, in fact, I don't even think. 1% of the population uses Facebook. So, I mean, if you're considering ways to open up the top of the funnel for users, definitely uh, this is a great thing to consider. But furthermore, like designing products for everybody, Facebook users, non-Facebook users, introduces a lot of challenges. So um, that was something that was a big, big portion of my first year at Tinder. Um, recently, I've been a little bit more active in a lot of different projects, sort of playing a little more dynamic role rather than being like just the profile and discovery guy. But one feature you, got, you guys might recognize if you're on Tinder is what we call Tappy. Um, and it was the ability to tap on the right and left sides of the card to view photos of that person without even opening profile. Basically, we recognized users don't open profile that often. And while that's really important and we want to make like a big holistic picture of every user, really allow them to tell a great story about themselves, um, photos are the sort of number one, I'd say, currency in Tinder. Like, if you're not attracted on that level, or if you if you can't communicate your interests or your personality to some degree visually, our attention span these days apparently can't handle. It. You know, like we'll move on. So, trying to make at least in this first iteration the ability to learn more about somebody a lot easier, and there's a lot more coming down that road. Uh, another project that I just launched and have been iterating on is Tinder Gold. Um, the last time we did a Q&A actually was the day that we launched that and the photo viewing UI, so that was, that was pretty fun to be back here on the same sort of day. We just launched a big update today for our Tinder Gold users, but um, it allows people to see who likes you for an additional fee. You might think that letting people see who likes you in Tinder actually weakens the experience, but for users who are looking for something faster, who don't have the time, and who just want the sort of no-nonsense Tinder experience, Tinder Gold is exactly that, and it allowed us to create an umbrella where we can put a lot of new features under that and create value for people who just want 
a better experience in the dating group, dating sphere. Excuse me. Um, so honestly, that is in a snapshot a lot of the things that I've done. Um, it's been sort of I'd say all together about eight years for me in the sort of tech product design space, but from you know apparel to actual hard goods like bicycles to mobile interfaces and stuff. I've kind of dabbled in it all, and I'd love to help answer some of your questions and give you guys some insight from what I've learned. Anybody want to kick it off? Mm. Yeah, I saw your hand first. Uh, what's your typical day look like? Yeah, well, change that week, starting on Monday to get in all the way to That's a good question. I think sometimes product management feels like you know a Monday to Friday job where it's all one arc and it all fits nicely into a two-week sprint for example but it really doesn't I can give you sort of a process over overview if that makes sense um, basically I think all product managers are responsible for a couple things the first thing is this sort of like driving the ideation the creativity and helping funnel new ideas in problem problem-solving ideas into the pipeline, into the product roadmap. And that's a lot of brainstorming. The front of this is a lot of sort of talking with the different teams and the people around your office, on your team, out in the real world, trying to understand what this problem is. Some companies treat this as an opportunity to like create personas, to really hone in on who you're trying to solve a problem for. Really like interview, dig into what these people are experiencing, the frictions, the different you know day-to-day -day struggles around what you're trying to solve. And for us, I think it's a bit of that, but it's also a bit of our own experience and a feeling in terms of like, is everything we're trying to build is supposed to be fun, lightweight, easy to use, and ultimately impactful. But we really focus on, at Tinder on the ease of use and the fun aspect of it. Um, and that's why you, you might see that we're willing to try kind of more out there things that don't seem like they're really moving the bottom line all the time. It's, it's great to be in a company that really has, you know, like a, uh, a revenue goal that they're constantly pushing towards and driving. But for us, it's a bit more of like the consumer experience as well as revenue, We're trying to create just a great product first and foremost. So there's a lot of iteration, a lot of testing on that front. As a designer, I work with a couple other uh, full-time designers and help sort of shape their ideas into low resolution concepts and prototypes. I'll take those prototypes, sort of across the room, meet with our like chief product guy, shoot, shoot them down, you know, like sort of see what sticks on the wall, and from there it sort of evolves through the pipeline. Does this make sense? Can we test it at a low scale somewhere around the world where we're not gonna mess up major markets or like sort of throw everybody off? Uh, it's not a secret, so I'll say like Australia is our favorite testing ground because, I mean, they're so fun and they're very, <laughs> they're very much like us in the demographics and the social apps they use and the sort of way they communicate through different tech products and stuff. So love testing things overseas first before we bring it to sort of major markets. And then through that process, not all in a week or two, mind you, it's kind of the, as you're working through these things, you'll understand where are the sort of the choke points the bottlenecks, where do users get hung up? Even if the prototype is like a couple screens that you're using in vision to tap through and understand what works, what feels right, what's the fastest. Um, you, can, you can figure out a lot of these things pretty quickly by watching users get into it. Um, after that, basically once you've got this solid idea, this thing that you're confident in, that you want to roll out to the masses, um, your, your week starts to look like a lot of chaos. It's talking with you know a lot of different teams at Tinder in terms of the CRM, the analytics teams, doing a lot of testing and bug finding and squashing and trying to get it ready for prime time launching. And then that's honestly where the real work begins. When you kind of rinse and repeat addressing all of the issues that users are facing with your new product, addressing your community team that is getting all of these calls and emails about some problem that you've introduced. And I mean, the cycle repeats itself. So that's, that's a, a week in many different projects, not all at the same time, but at different stages along the way. So, hope that helps paint a picture. Um, how's the transition to mobile apps? Because coming from, for example, me coming from an e-commerce and back-end CRM platform product manager, um, and you weren't you weren't doing mobile apps at the time, like or when you first starting out. How was that transition process? It's rough. Yeah. I and how did you get to like? being as experienced as you are? Well, the short answer is by doing it. 
But to answer the first question, I was probably the worst mobile designer that's ever existed. I wish I still had some of these uh, screens, and I do, but I can <laughs> keep them locked away. But you know, one thing that I learned pretty quickly when this, this inexperienced CEO and this inexperienced product designer guy and myself got together and started working on human was that there's sort of a spectrum, a couple spectrums, but on one end of this spectrum is familiarity. These are things you've already seen. These are the native apps on the device, experiences that you use every single day and you don't think twice about. Not because they're great, but because they're dead simple. They're almost utilitarian at this point. On the other side of the spectrum is innovation. That's like gestures. Snapchat is one of those apps that actually resembles the initial navigation that we created for human. We thought it was going to be so cool with your phone if you slid to the, to the left and revealed the keypad where you could dial people in. Of course. It's brilliant, right? I mean, as soon as we got it into people's hands, though, it was a disaster. Like, honestly, nobody knew what they were doing. Nobody could find anything. And what we realized is you don't want to make users work to find out the valuable part of your app. You don't want to cause a hang-up before they even see that magical, like, aha moment in the app that, that really hooks them. You want them to focus on that piece and let that be the, the uh, identifying sort of individual or you know, value-add experience. Uh, Snapchat got away with it, honestly, and I think that putting them on a pedestal in, in terms of UX is, is dangerous because they're working with a very young demographic that is great with mobile, born on mobile, but also so willing to tinker and learn and discover new features. Have, have you all seen the Maps feature on Snapchat where you can see your friends? Yeah, I couldn't find it. <laughs> yeah, so we will have to get to it. Snapchat created a feature that basically shows you where all your friends are if they share that information. And uh, they announced it and I rolled it out. And I went to go find it. And I had to go back to the news that I was lucky enough to catch because I'm, you know, I'm in tech and I'm trying to pay attention here. Like, and then figure out how the hell I get to it. Like, they, they did do educational pop ups and stuff, but. Just like every other user, I just want to get those out of my way, typically. I think I even skipped over it. Like, it's interrupting my process, so I just like, swatted it away. Um, but like, they get lucky, that, or maybe they don't. I don't really have their data, that uh, their users do figure this out. Um, swiping between navigations is not going to be as efficient as a tab bar. I'm not saying like you should make things that are utilitarian, but there's definitely a spectrum that at some point, you guys have to decide if you're building a product, like, where does yours fit on this? On this whole array. Because for us, building a contacts app, we were competing against things that were second nature, that were so obvious and so fast, and it had to be really familiar. So, I mean, through a lot of, to answer your second question, still a lot of practice and testing. So just balancing between simple and um, innovative? That's one thing to, like, to understand when you're designing products. I think your <coughs> second question was more like, how did I get good at it? And it's just making a lot of bad things. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to know what's the best way to create a product roadmap as a product manager? Um, yeah. That's going to vary. I think every company has its own objectives and at different stages you can sacrifice different things. Tinder's at a point today where we don't need to be worrying about acquiring new users. Worrying about it like that's the lifeblood of our company is different than like wanting to do it because it grows our business and helps us create better products for more people. It's really like the priorities are different along every different stage of the company and startup and depending on what the industry is. Um, so I think it takes like a good product manager or a good leader of product, whether or not that's the role of a PM in your company, is to understand what are the most critical problems that you need to solve. But Better than a roadmap is like almost, I keep this said a lot in our industry, but it's the focus with which you can really apply to this one thing. For example, if you solve this problem, will it retain these users for the amount of time that you need it to? If you solve this problem, will it add this many users to keep your product growing? A lot of startups and, and tech products today really require a, a strong user base to stay alive. In the dating space, that couldn't be more true. You know, there's a reason why there are a thousand, call it 10,000 dating apps, and very few with any sort of degree of success, and that's because the community effect is so important. Um, 
And I think another good example is this app, HQ Trivia. It just came out. It allows people to gather on an app in the interface at certain times of the day, Pacific time, I think 12 o'clock and 6 p.m. And everybody knows to use the app right then. They, they notify you, they get you together, and they create one local sort of trivia experience for everybody in that time zone. And that's their way of getting everybody there at once. But I'm digressing a little bit. I guess the point is like, you know, figure out what keeps your product alive and growing and make sure you address those things first because it's easy to get distracted by awesome user experiences. It's almost easier to like make something perfect before you make it good in that sense. That's way too deep. But I think if you, if you understand where I'm coming from, that, yeah, that, that is really important. Awesome, of course. Yeah. What do you design in? What's that again? What do you design in? Like what's all? Oh, okay. I use Sketch almost exclusively. When I started, it was Photoshop. And that was a disaster in terms of like a tool that's not really made for this. I really wouldn't recommend using Photoshop today, even though they've started, uh, you know, improving their features for mobile interface design and even web. Um, I think Sketch is like born for mobile, and even Apple in releasing the iPhone 10 and all of their resources made it for Sketch. You know, you'll notice that that's become the industry standard. At Tinder, is there any like a single individual or department that is um, the best cider when it comes to a new feature? I'm sure there's a lot of features on backlog and you're gonna launch a certain feature at a time, but mm -hmm. is there any like a single individual who's like an ultimate decider what to launch? I would say I mean, yes, there is our CEO who's been very involved in product and he's great, his name is Greg Blatt. Um, but alongside him is our COO, her name is Char, and our chief product guy, his name is Brian Norgard. And the three of them really, along with our head of engineering, Maria, this is being filmed so I will not forget her name, or like the, how important she is, but the four of them really are the, the group that says, these things we agree are gonna move the right needles, and this is the order with which we're gonna launch these things. We're a company of, I'm going to say at this point, probably 10 product managers, 12 junior and senior product managers, and we all want our features to go first. Part of being a PM too that I love to talk about is how you get your features on the roadmap. I think I don't know if, I mean, we have some PMs here, but it applies in a lot of companies, like how you get your ideas heard. Uh, the idea about tapping on the photos, for example, on the cards to see photos through Tinder, was called Project Tappy, and I named it after Brian Norgard, our chief product guy's last company that he sold to Tinder. And if he was looking at a project list and saying, okay, what are we gonna put on the roadmap, and he saw Project Tappy, like his last company that he started, or like when we actually began, got resources to work on it, and we were like ready, ready to launch globally, and everyone's kind of hesitant, not really sure about it yet, not sure about the numbers, when he, when he sees Project Tappy and says, like, are we going to launch this thing? Of course, he's like hitting that big red button. He's like, oh, of course. Why would I not? It's like me trying to launch Project Soleil. I mean, I would be biased. So, like, I mean, there's like there's a lot of sneaky tactics you can use. But honestly, it's, it's really about working with an entire organization. Everybody who you can possibly show your ideas to. Getting their buy-in. Getting their opinions on it. Getting them involved in the project early and often so that everybody has buy-in, has contributed. And then it wouldn't matter if the person at the top says, yeah, I don't really want to do that. Everybody on every other level is bought in, is excited, has contributed, has made it in some way their own, and in that way improved it. So there's a lot more likelihood that that project is going to go out. Um, so a little digression, but I think when we're working as PMs in tech companies or in big organizations, figuring out how to get your projects in front of the right people and uh, and built ultimately is, is a huge skill set that everybody can practice and, and will be practicing if you're in the industry. Any questions? Mm -hmm. How often does your uh, like your team specifically uh, release new features? It varies. Um, it's been a busy fall for us, so I mean it comes in waves, and it's not necessarily something that's scheduled where we go, okay, we need to build this. We're fortunate to have a strong base where we can. Um, let's say, wait on an idea. Say we get it to the 80% mark, and we've been testing it, and we're really excited about it. 
and you know we like it, but it's, it might not be perfect yet. We're the sort of company that is more likely to put it on the back burners and wait, like we did, for example, with Tappy, and really try to perfect it and work out some kinks or just improve the experience overall, make it simpler, make it even just more attractive, and release it when it's fully fully cooked. Or at least, you know, in sort of the Facebook mantra of shipping early and often, we'll we'll launch it in a small, small market and just see how it does. Do do a lot of qualitative and quantitative analysis of how that thing's doing and sort of regroup as we're still working on work, you know, fixing the kinks. Mm -hmm. um, no schedule really to answer your question. My name is Amanda, and I have a question for you about uh, how to involve more in the engineering process. It sounds like it's a very you have a little bit more of like a design view. Uh, so we can just talk about that at Tinder and maybe some of your previous smaller Totally. Um, my involvement with engineering is probably closer or more frequent than my involvement with really other product people. Um, like I described, sort of the arc of building a product with the tech company is you know, ideation, concepting and prototyping, which can involve some engineering or not, you know, depending on the fidelity. And then ultimately, you're going to be building that, testing it, launching it, and iterating on that project. So I'm kind of in the pit with engineers every day at some point. I have weekly sync meetings with the entire engineering management team. I'm like working with them on a UI side because that's more my background and sort of the macro side in terms of how things are going to work and what we can afford to do. They'll ask, I think one of the things I've learned from them recently is that engineers will build what the spec says it sh you know, should be built. They'll match exactly the specifications, give it the same functionality that has been asked for, <coughs> and they will do just that. They'll follow the blueprint. But sometimes, it was described to me, I'm going to butcher this quote, um, you can work three weeks to save a couple hours of planning on it. Right? Basically, like engineers might work a very long time building to the specifications, not considering how it might evolve over time, what you might need in the next iterations, what you might really be thinking about doing before launch. And um, the communication is really key between product and engineering to prevent them from building things exactly how you've laid them out for version one, for example. So that you know, when version two comes around, it's like a rebuild. You know, you need to start from the ground up. Oh, we didn't even consider that you might want to do that next. Like, we didn't even allow that to happen. We built it in a way that just like got this one thing done, and we're going to have to do a bit of a foundational change in order to support this new idea. So, if you can again work with your engineers, work with everybody from the data, from like all departments of your company on an idea early and often, and, and sort of talk them through your high level thinking where this is supposed to go, the vision for where this will end up and what it's going to change, then you're going to end up saving a lot of time ultimately. Um, I wish I knew that quote. That was a terrible, terrible attempt. <laughs> OK. Um, I, you already asked a question. Did you still know your question? Yeah. So you've worked hard. you built the idea. You got the attention. Everybody's on board. You built it. Now you're attached. And you got it released. You got some good metrics. And once you release it, it mm -hmm. when do you kill it? Hmm. That's uh, just that's interesting. A, a note because this came to me because of you know, social. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. What drove the idea of killing it after so long of walking? Rest in peace, Tinder social. I <laughs> uh, <laughs> thought that was pretty sneaky, just removing it from the navigation. Okay. Okay. You noticed. <laughs> you noticed. Fine. Um, so. You know, everything's an experiment, and you can build a really awesome feature, really awesome experience that ultimately doesn't move the needle, or more importantly, becomes a lot of baggage down the road as you're trying to design new things. There, I think a lot of people will talk about sort of some cost, trying not to consider, you know, dragging something along just because you've already built it, just because it's there. Um, part of building a product that's successful and great, I think, is also making it really simple. And even in the first iteration, even when you don't have that many features, it's really about um, the things that you don't need. And that is the product of a lot of work. It doesn't come on the first iteration, I swear. 
things are typically pretty complicated the first go around. So for us, in order to expand and try new things and introduce new experiences for people to meet one another, something had to go. And it's not to say that it won't ever be back. It won't be to say that like we won't do it better next time. But in its implementation that we had, we know we could do it a lot better, even a lot faster, in a, a new, more exciting way if we got rid of it for now. It's tough because there's like the PR side, there's the communications and marketing going like, okay, this looks like a failure, right? Like we're part of a public company. This is going to come up, you know, why did you do this for the numbers or like so on and so forth. And we'd have to answer to somebody much, well, I mean, obviously the investors at some point. So but what drove the decision? The decision was driven by the fact that we knew we could do better and that what I can say is that keeping things around just because they're there doesn't, it's not always like the best decision. I think honestly that's, that it clouds our judgment. We could become attached to these things. We put so much time into it. But at Tinder, we put a lot of time into things that you guys have never seen. And for good reason, <clears throat> excuse me. But I mean, that's kind of part of it. It's, it's about being honest with yourselves about what you built, your creations. And I think the more you can take a pessimistic lens at everything you create, critical lens, I should say, you're going to be in a much better, more honest position. Um, it's not to say that people didn't like Tinder Social. I think a lot of people did, and we, we heard about it quite a bit when, when it disappeared one day. Was it data driven decision to kill it? Uh, I can't really talk about why we did it, but um, like I said, things get heavier the more you build and add on to a foundation. It was an old foundation that had been around now for five years plus, and you know, it was time to try new things without making the experience more complicated. I'd say Facebook is a great example of an app that just kept everything. Have you ever opened that drawer, that three bar menu, and seen just that list of things they're doing? Would you imagine? Like, oh, have you considered uh, places when you were you know, building this feature? Oh, did you support like the events and the Find My Friends and this, that, and the six other things? It's got to be like 30 apps within Facebook at this point. It's crazy. So, I mean, in order to move quickly, you can't really have that much baggage. So it becomes much more difficult. Even when you build new operating system supports, if you're going to build for web, if you're going to build for Android or Apple TV, I think Tinder also has all of those. Um, so things get more complicated. And you definitely want to move quickly when you're young as a company. All right, back corner. If you look at Facebook as an app, there's starting to become this uh, kind of emergence of app and media, mm -hmm. right? You know, Facebook Live, how that's going. Would you say Tinder is kind of going that same route? Because I've talked about you guys sort of build products to kind of cater towards that a little bit. So I'm just curious, like, are you starting to incorporate that media aspect? Into the it's app? hard to say where we're going. But I'll talk about Facebook first. They definitely transitioned from being, you know, the social media company to being like a straight-up media company. Right. Like the ratio of articles and videos and that sort of content that you see in your feed relative to people's updates and statuses, not related to news or media, I think is very heavy in the media side. And that's what generated a lot of their ad sales. We're not an ad-driven company. Our, our content is people, and we're trying to make that better right now, we'll say. Like, who knows what comes next, but I think catering to that is, we still have a long way to go in that sense. Would you say you guys are looking at like uh, VR or augmented reality aspects to really the dating experience, enhancing the dating experience? It's interesting. Um, can't really say what we're looking at. <laughs> but I mean, there's a lot of fun ways that all of the products that we're used to using and you know, our daily apps basically, our whole you know, lunchbox of things that we wake up to and check every morning are gonna be enhanced or made different by emerging platforms. I mean, that's where I think some of the more exciting innovations are happening, like in, in the areas where we don't have just a whole saturated market, where every beckon call, every need, every pizza, the press of a button can just be delivered, you know, 
new ways of interacting with interfaces are going to be, at least for me, an exciting new frontier in terms of design and product development. Not said that that's like where the money's at, not even necessarily at all in the beginning until it becomes a more popular platform, but that's where I think the new exciting experiences are. Um, yeah. How does the, I'm curious to learn how the competitive landscape of Tinder as a product affects your future work around and the evolution of Tinder. So specifically, um, you've, got, you've got a lot of other dating apps in the space, they come out with features that you use receive a lot of. I mean, think about Snapchat, Instagram, Snapchat comes out with you know, stories on Monday, Instagram has stories on Wednesday, mm -hmm. you know, it's like there's this, there's this kind of Dance that's going on between new features and uh, how we engage with those respond. So, you know, if, if somebody suggests a feature um, that could be seen as a as a similar similar to something that an app has, or for this kind of YouTube feature or some of those, are there any feelings of anxiety um, in kind of formulating the product for an app and say, well, you know, if we if we look at adding adding in these features to be like this app, because uh, or, or is it just more of a data-driven decision? This is what the market wants, or maybe we start to hear what we're just going to do. What's that decision-making process like when it comes to these, these kind of the features that we're we'll seeing? Yeah, honestly, I think um, you might plan a, a great call it picnic, like Southcast, and you can't predict the weather. You can't understand what the issues are going to come up down the road that are going to change your roadmap. Like, Half of the product roadmap, if we were smart about it, would be the things that we strategically want to do based on the KPIs, the key performance indicators that we want to move. And the other half would definitely be the reactive features. Often those aren't that big, but you know, the things that come up as a result of a problem, or as the result of somebody misusing your platform, or as the result of spam and unforeseen you know, data requests in Europe. Um, that will get some. And uh, you know those become really urgent. They can derail a whole product process, and it's kind of about balancing that, keeping your hand on the pulse of what's going on and how users are having bad experiences in your app and being able to adapt to those while you also pick on the things that are sort of more macro, higher level, more strategic place for your company. It's, it's definitely reactive. I think Facebook's, what, so what Snapchat did from my perspective is it made posting a lot easier because we're not so hung up about it. This isn't going to be on my Instagram forever. It's not going to define me and my brand. It's just I can, something I can throw out into the ether. And I got people posting a lot more. You could call that their problem solved to the social media market. And Facebook and Instagram and their whole umbrella of a billion brands basically said, oh god, they just solved this one thing that we couldn't figure out. Like the thing that honestly like would have changed our product. And we might not have been able to do unless they had done it first. Um, and they reacted to it. They built their own version of it. For them, I think it's a lot more apples to apples. It's literally the sort of same social space that they're trying to, to fight over, the same users, the same sort of user behavior. You know, you also, I don't know if it were, there were jokes or like every other app seemed to have stories within the same you know, year, you know? Um, but yeah, at some point, I couldn't tell if it was all just like some big comedic gag where like new products like your password app would, would launch stories, you know? But uh, it was ridiculous. Like, it doesn't make sense. That's where you have to really understand like what are the problems your users are, are experiencing and does this actually solve it? And I think Facebook would have found out pretty quickly that in the test, nobody thinks of their Facebook graph of friends the same way as their Instagram graph. And I mean, Instagram nailed it. I think they actually did a lot of things better than Snapchat. It's more discoverable. They actually like because of the relativeness of their two user bases and the use cases, it it just made it actually a much better platform for daily posting and stuff like that. But is that exactly a fair summary though? Because I mean that's kind of like a natural evolution of social media, right? Facebook couldn't have possibly known that a broad base of users were going to look at their Facebook users <coughs> differently from the users on a completely different social media platform when Facebook was first created. First created? I mean, that's old Facebook. That's like kind of what Instagram is now. That's when we were posting things and photos and albums and 
you know, we were sharing with our friend graph and, and having conversations on Facebook and, you know, on, in a public way. And I think they might have still thought they were that Facebook to an extent, but they've become this media company like you described. That's almost where I get a good portion of my news just because I know they're going to serve me the things I like to read. 